Welcome to Cultivate, a Veritas Academy podcast, where we explore truth, beauty, and goodness through meaningful conversation. We invite you to join us in discussions meant to edify your mind, encourage your heart, and equip your family to live abundantly in Christ. Welcome back to Cultivate. I'm Ty Fisher, the head of school here at Veritas and the host of Cultivate. And I'm really thankful today to have two teachers who have been I don't know if uh, what the, what even the right word. I was going to say legendary, but legendary is like legends sometimes are not true. But then I was going to say like backbone, you know, foundational teachers here at Veritas Academy. So I have with me Sharon Strawbridge, one of our first grade teachers, and Deb Chapin, one of our second grade teachers. Now, I say one of because we just split their classes into two classes now. So there's two first grade teachers and two second grade teachers. But for a long time, there was one first grade and one second grade. And so many of our alumni, well, in fact, almost all of our alumni at this point have had Deb for second grade and Sharon for first grade. So just so thankful for their work here at Veritas. And today we're going to talk about a topic that I know is one that is very interesting to them, and that is helping your kids love reading. So I'm just going to jump into some questions here. Um, Could both of you tell us a little bit just about your history of teaching at Veritas so people would be able to know why I say backbone and legend and that kind of stuff? Hi, Ty. Hey, Sharon. I remember in 1993 in Mississippi... I was teaching in a school, and I saw a group of first graders walking down the hall. And I wasn't teaching first grade at the time, but I asked the Lord, I would love a first grade class one day. And in 2003... He was listening, by the way. Yes, he's always listening. But in 2003, I had moved to Pennsylvania, and my family was here, and Veritas Academy was here, and I started teaching my first grade class class, and this year it will be the beginning of my 20th year at Veritas. Wow, and she was only eight years old when she hired in here at Veritas. Not quite. <laughs> Not quite, okay. Okay, and Deb, what about you? I was, I didn't know anything about, about classical Christian education, and so 20 Seven years ago when you asked me, I said no. And what I <laughs> No, you, you said it's going to take an act of God to get me back in the classroom. <laughs> Well, that's what happened, I guess. <laughs> and and then I, oh, when you asked me again, I, I, I wanted to, and, and I've never looked back. Teaching second grade at Veritas has been uh, the highlight of my career. That's that's so wonderful to hear. So thank you both for all of the work that you, you've done. But at Veritas in, the, in these younger grades, kindergarten, first, and second grade, so much of what we do is really focused on two. It's you know we learn uh, we learn Bible and we learn history and we learn all, all kinds of other things. But there are two skills that we're really focusing on, and one is reading and the other is math. And today we're going to talk about reading. And there are two parts to learning to read. The first is a mechanical part, teaching students how to sound out letters and to know words. The other part is inspiring the love of reading so that they're going to practice it enough that they'll get to be good at it. I mean, it's always hard for me to believe that there are debates raging about the best way to teach foundational reading, but could could you explain the difference between maybe something that you might that, that we might hear in culture called a whole language approach and a phonics-based approach like the one we use at Veritas? Yes, I I think that as we look, as I have just looked over um, the information about whole language approaches that began really around the 70s and the 80s. Could people read before the 70s Yes, and 80s? they could. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> but, um, but they focused on uh, teaching children the meaning of words, and they talked a lot about the importance of meaning, and they got away from the systematic approach of phonics, of just teaching, beginning with the phonics, practice and helping children see the breakdown of words into sounds. And I feel like 
in the whole language approach, there is a phonics component and lots of books and, and helping, helping children think about the meaning of words and helping children think about how it relates to them. But I feel like it's so important to start with the beginning and help children understand how words are made and using the sounds to help them be able to attack words that they are that are not familiar and to even though there are so many rule breakers in in our language the starting with the sounds and the phonetic approach yeah because when you're in first and second grade almost every word is unfamiliar like your vocabulary is still is still growing and it seems to me like the whole language approach where you kind of, you know, just learn the meaning of a word or like eventually that's kind of where we get, right? You know, I don't look at the newspaper and sound out every word, but if I didn't have that phonics foundation, I never would have gotten to the place where I could sound out words and, and build that vocabulary up to where I was finally comfortable in just reading. So Deb, what have you seen concerning the phonics-based approach here at Veritas, does it help students start reading well, typically? Yes. While there are individual children who could learn to read that way, you just hand them a book. And you mean the, the whole language way? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, you know, they, especially if, if they're read to a lot as children, then they just learn to, you know, uh, to recognize words, and as there are individual children that that would work for, but it really uh, doesn't work for for most children. So when Sharon's children uh, come to my class, they know that letters have a sound associated with them, and they know it well. They know that B says B, and A can say A or A, ah or and and that's so familiar to them that then I can just open up a whole world of delightful language experiences and they have the skills that they need to to a, a good progress in reading. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and okay, so, you know, we, we talk about mechanics, right? And, and, and if you don't, if you don't have the, if your car doesn't have the mechanicals right, it's not going to go anywhere. But you can have all the mechanicals right and not enjoy the drive, right? So when we think about one of the most important things that after we get done with that, those mechanics, that's not even half the battle because we want students to love reading. How do you work on that and encourage that in your classrooms? Because when I come down to see kids reading in second grade and first grade, I see them loving what they're doing. How do you two inspire that? Is there a special like dust, fairy dust or something like that they use? Well, we try to have a lot of fun with reading. I have so many good books in my room and and we I just try to first of all, I love children's literature and I love books. So I think they feel it coming out of me and and I get excited about reading to them. And I get excited to open the same book for the 20th year and to share it with them. And um, the primers that we have in our curriculum have lots of things that we can use to make it fun. We make rockets when we read about Moon Mission. We make swords when we learn learn about the sword of Rob Roy. And so we're trying to just have fun as we read and as we learn and enjoy the books. Yeah. And then they go on to... They go on to your class, Deb, and and really, there's a big jump from first grade reading to second grade reading. So describe maybe some of what they're doing in second grade, and how how do you inspire love when it's getting a lot tougher? Well, we start with we start chapter books, and the children are excited about that because that seems so grown up. And I, I think one of the things, reasons it works is because we've given them the skills that they need to do what I'm asking them to do. And so we start with a Boxcar Children, Encyclopedia Brown, Winnie the Pooh, Little House in the Big Woods, Little House in the Prairie, Railway Children, Pinocchio, Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales. And I've, I, I remember a girl, a, a student who had graduated, and she said to me, I learned to love to read 
when I read those books in second grade because they're wonderful books. And here I've been doing almost those exact books for 25 years, and I still enjoy reading them. They're well, just wonderful books. It's because they're classics. Like when you went down that list, those are books that, and I, I don't want to be like, I don't want to make Encyclopedia Brown more than he really is. Right. I think it, you've got Pinocchio and Little House on the Prairie that are maybe in a a little bit more of a, you know, they're going to be used years and years from now. But every generation is fed by those same stories. Mm-hmm. And, and they're still enjoyable to us as adults, yes. right? And that's why when you go back to them every year, you're not like drat Pinocchio. Right. You're like, oh, this is wonderful. They yes. get to share this with another group of children. And early on, there was a, a lot of talk about, you know, some of these books, like Encyclopedia Brown, are more boys' books. Uh-huh. And other of, of, of the books we read are more by girls. But we read them all, and uh, that gives everyone an, an opportunity to enjoy. That's exactly right. Now, this next question I'm going to point towards Sharon a little bit, because Deb's working on chapter books, but you're working on some primers, right? So talk to me about what those primers are like. You mentioned a few of them and some of the the things that you do when you're reading them. Maybe name some of them that have been really, you've seen kids really enjoy and and describe to parents, like, so I think they have an idea what Pinocchio is or what a chapter book is, but help us, help parents understand what that primer is and what its purpose is. Yes, our curriculum has been written with the mind to have primers that are more than Dick and Jane, are the, they're more than subjects that are, may have written an about uh, about historical figures that use the sounds that we have been practicing. Yeah. So the very first book we read is Ella Sings Jazz. Okay. And I've learned a lot of things in my years being a first grade teacher from these primer books. And Probably we, got introduced to a lot of good music yes, if you're doing Ella yes, Fitzgerald. Yes, we turn on Ella, we dance to Ella that first couple of weeks, and we sing. Boring, um, honestly. Yeah. I mean... D- Sometimes. I mean, how many times can Dick and Jane, <laughs> like, sit under the tree? I mean, that, that, that's nothing. I, I mean, yeah, there there's some good things about those books. But I, I'm not I, trying. Yes, I appreciate, though, that this curriculum has so many historical and wonderful and exciting books that people have written, people in our community. We sing while we're learning ing ang ong sounds. <laughs> and I've also learned about the tale of Sir Galahad when we're doing the oi sound. There's a boy named Roy in this book, and he meets lots of historical people. And also, just like Deb said, there are more, there are books that Maybe the boys will really get excited about the Sword of Rob Roy, King Alfred. Anything that involves war or breaking things. Yes, and they can get excited about reading more sometimes with books Mm -hmm. like that. And also Anne Bradstreet. I've learned a lot of other history with those kind of... So is uh, Anne Bradstreet a boy favorite or a girl favorite? Oh, yes. Anne Bradstreet would probably be... Well, I think she's both, but the girls really enjoy her too as the poet. Do you do... Do you do quote quote the prophet? And I do quote the prophet. That is such. That's one of my favorite primers because it is the story. If I remember right, it's the story of Moses and Aaron talking with Pharaoh, but it's set in a language kind of pattern of the poem "The Raven." That's from, correct. And I just think what's really fun at Veritas. I mean, you probably talk about you know, Edgar Allan Poe and the Raven and stuff like that. But kids, first graders aren't going to read the Raven. But when they get to the Raven, reading the Raven like in ninth grade, they're just going back to quote the prophet. Right. And they will remember that. I think I talked to the fourth grade teacher who happens to be your wife. Yeah. Um, when, when they start studying about King Alfred in the fourth grade and first graders, the fourth grade, the fourth graders then will remember, oh, this is about the same person that we learned in first yes. grade so all of those connections yes. that go all the way through our school yes now deb the one of the interesting thing for parents might be that when i go to visit second grade how many books are your students reading at once so how they and what i mean is there are some books that they read aloud 
and there are some books that they don't read aloud. What's going on there? We read a, a literature book, and each child reads aloud every day. And when it's a short chapter, that means they just read a, a paragraph. But as, as the year progresses, sometimes they're reading a whole page, and they're reading aloud. That gives me an opportunity to hear their phonic errors or their uh, misunderstanding so that I can correct them, and, and then also to help uh, I describe vocabulary words. Okay, That, that oral but, reading is so important for a teacher to hear because then you can know exactly what they need to work on. Yes, and somewhat unique to Veritas is we have an oral reading score that, that we use so that we grade children on, on how they read. So it's they're reading loudly enough and accurately and, and stopping at, at periods and pausing at commas. So all of that feeds into that. But then also, I usually have a book that I'm reading aloud to them at the end of the day when we have extra minutes. And then Sharon really starts this, but they get to go to a bookshelf and pick any book they like. And, you know, different children pick different books and they just learn to love books. And I love to see them in the back of my room when when they're finished with their work. Some children might still be working and they're showing each other what they found in a book and showing a picture and then trying to read. And some of them are like pretty high level books. And, and, and so they're trying to read the caption to figure out. And sometimes they'll come up and ask me, sure. but they are just getting excited about books, yeah. which is something we really love. Which leads to some really fun stories here at Veritas, like kids, first graders trying to read the Chronicles of Narnia, walking into walls and things like that. And I I know I've been in classes before. I would imagine it's happened in your classes when, you know, there's a student that's not paying attention to the lesson. And then when the teacher see, gets to see what they are paying attention to, they're actually like reading a book, like, down under their desk and I'm like well maybe that should be trouble but that's like it's a low level trouble if you're you're so interested in a book that you're that you're not paying as much attention as you should it breaks our hearts to <laughs> punish children for reading even during math class <laughs> right 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 but they do need to learn that math as well but that is a real sign you know just like that might be a sign for you that your students are loving reading in the right way. It's always a sign for me as someone who's taught in our secondary school in the omnibus curriculum that I'll have students that will say, what should I read over Christmas break? Or what should I read in the summer? Once, and I was, we had a student, one of our earliest graduates, Ben Long, and he asked me what he should read, and I said that on vacation he should read The Count of Monte Cristo, which is a really great adventure story. Now, I, uh, he came back, and I said, well, how'd you like it? And he's like, what are you trying to do to me? Like, I needed to have vacation, not just read all the time. And, and I didn't realize that the version of The Count of Monte Cristo I had was an abridged version of 700 pages. So I wow. sent him on vacation with a 1,400-page book. Um, anyway, uh, so how do you encourage and inspire the reading outside of books that are assigned? So you, you're, you're letting them pick one. But what you really want to see is when they go home and when they're on the weekends and those kinds of things. How do you how do you inspire students to be interested in reading at that level? I often ask on Monday morning, did anyone read a book this uh, weekend? Or, you know, just questions like that that talk about in re- reading at your house. You know, what what are your favorite books that you like to read at night? What are you reading on your couch at night? And just reminding them that it's not just a a school thing. Yeah. (laughs) So those are some of the things that help. And then also sometimes you give an encouragement of, you know, if you've read this many minutes every night, you know, color this in or put an X here and let's see if you can get to 20 and we'll have a surprise. Those kind of things that help them. So you're really celebrating the, that, that love of reading by, by letting them accomplish things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Deb, what about you? I, I think one of the things that we do best is we have wonderful books placed in prominent places. I talked to a, a teacher who didn't have a single book in his classroom, which is 
to, to me was ludicrous. But the, the, that doesn't seem possible, it, does it? It, it? it does not. But we have wonderful, wonderful books, and I, I, I have uh, many books that I have like. 20 copies of, so we can all have our own copy when we read. I mean, probably like no school that I've ever been in where we have all of these books that are available to the children. Well, that availability and even how they're placed prominently in the classroom, I, I think leads to a love of reading. Like I, as some of them will just be looking at that book. I want to read that one. I can't wait till I get to read that one, you know, and, and, and they'll almost fight over them, you know, like someone's reading this one, so they have to wait. Uh, and until someone's done with that. And, yeah. and, and and that's a wonderful thing to be striving for. Well, you, you mentioned that, Deb, and, and I we had a, a middle school student that was decided one year they didn't want to come back to Veritas. They, they transferred to one of the local public schools. And then mid-year, they ended up transferring back to Veritas. And I, I sat down with the student and said, you know, we're not really that different than when you left. Like, if you didn't like us then, you're probably not going to like school here now. And and I said, why, why do you want to come back? And he said, books. Like, we don't have any books at, at the, in the classroom. We don't read. And, and I was just kind of shaking my head. And that was years ago. So I'm, I'm afraid that, I'm afraid that the modern education a lot of times is more about teaching kids to manipulate things with tools, technological tools often, rather than causing them to have the skills that it needs to stir the loves of their heart, which is what we're after. So, But that's just an editorial comment here. Um, so what are some of the most fun reading stories that you've seen among students that you've taught here at Veritas? Well, Frog and Toad is one of my favorites. So Frog and Toad is a very fun book to read in, in my first grade class. And we even have a special, fr- I have a special friend who brings tadpoles to my classroom in March when we start reading Frog and Toad. And, and they're la- not just tapioca. Those are no, real tadpoles. Real tadpoles. And we get to watch them and... For the last two years, we've actually made it to the end of the school year with real little tiny tree frogs. Really? That's been a really fun way to enjoy Frog and Toad. Henry and Mudge, Francis Books, Curious George, Little Bear Books. Those are all some that my first graders really, really enjoy and I get to enjoy with them. Yeah. Well, and Deb, you've kind of given us your reading list already. Are there things that you can think about where um, that been a really fun thing that you've interacted with concerning a student and a book that they love or something like that? Well, probably the a book that we laugh hardest about is, is Winnie the Pooh. And it's just exciting to, you know, uh, I'll be reading and, you know, uh, uh, children that are good readers are kind of reading ahead. And so they start to laugh before the rest uh, of the class does. And, and I think that's just a, a delight. That's, you know? when, that's when you know they're reading ahead. Yes. When they yes. start laughing before the punchline. Right, right. So that really is so exciting to see kids that excited. Pinocchio it is an amazing book. And, and has a, a redemption theme where at, at one point in the book he says, I wish I could be born again and go back. And, you know, for children who know that they have evil hearts, that is, is a wonderful theme for them. Yes, I can, I can go back and I can make things right. And, and there's just such a, a, a delight and excitement in, in that book. And then I think the, the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales, you know, Ugly Duckling and Snow Queen, which is just, which isn't anything like Disney, but <laughs> it, it's just so exciting for them to, to, to read. And then when I explain to them that C.S. Lewis borrowed the Snow Queen for Narnia from Hans Christian Andersen, and in their little minds, you know, Boy, they, that's that's like, like a. Uh, extra. They can't put those in dates, but but I'm just like, wow. You mean C.S. Lewis borrowed a, a character, and and so it's just you know all that stuff just comes alive and it's wonderful. Well, it's a good thing too. They, this the the scriptures say that you know we have a sinful heart of stone until God replaces it with a heart of flesh. But thankfully, none of your kids are made of wood. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So as parents in a culture that. I would say, and, and, you know, I've been head of school here now for many years, but when I think back to the beginning of my time here, you know, well more, almost three decades ago, 
now. Uh, our culture had a different attitude toward reading than it does now. So I know that many young parents, you know, they're raising children in a world that's increasingly technologically driven, in, increasingly what I would say is visually driven rather than rather than driven toward reading and understanding the word. And as a Christian, that really worries me because God communicated to us in words. So what advice would you give to parents who are trying to help their children love reading? I encourage my first grade parents often during the year to read together Mm -hmm. every night or not every night because no one can do it every night, but often and to make it fun and to find books about things that interest their children and to take turns as they're reading instead of just thinking, okay, we have to we listen to my child read and this is so terrible, but to take turns and to enjoy it, make it fun and go to the library, to go to bookstores, to make, to, to push back on the culture sometimes that, that is just leaving out books and leaving out book time. And also, I always encourage them to get a hold of the Read Aloud about Revival by Sarah McKenzie, Honey for a Child's Heart by Gladys Hunt, and a new book, um, Wild Things and Castles in the Sky, a Guide to Choosing the Best Books for Children, edited by friends of ours, Leslie and Carrie Buster. Oh, I'm so glad that you mentioned that book. Rosenberg. Yeah. So invest in good books and read good books together, even if it's just a little bit a day to to show your children how important books are to you and to enjoy the books together. You know, my love of reading really started when when I was a little boy. I was a terrible sleeper. And the way that my mom would try to get me to go to sleep was she would sit at the foot of the bed, usually a rocking chair, and and just read Bible stories to me. Now, unfortunately for her, I was very interested in the stories. So she'd I'd lay there quietly and she'd get to the end and then when I heard the book close, I would say, I'm not I'm not asleep yet. <laughs> and and she was a long suffering woman and she would just keep reading. So you know, what you said is true, Sharon, so true. Deb, any advice? I, I, I was going to say, finding books that delight. Reading, just to read. I mean, I mean, all all of our lives, children are going to be asked to read books that they're not particularly interested in. So when, when they're choosing books, it should be books that, that delight that child. And, you know, the whole idea of reading being a, a delight is used to be a common theme but now it is is like oh no you should read these books no no like i think having children read books that delight them and delight their parents is is one of the important things that fosters a love of reading well and it actually really holds a culture together yes you know it, it's it's interesting that uh, you know, one of our seventh graders this last year was at football practice with, and he was, he asked the players on his team, it's a community league, not in Lancaster County. And he, he asked the players on his team, what are you reading? He was assuming that they were reading stuff. And they said, no, we're not, we don't read books at our school. And, and he said, I'm reading the Odyssey. You know, the Odyssey is that, you know, you can talk about the Odyssey with your grandparents and with your great grandparents because it's a book that they read. And that's true of Pinocchio, and that's true of Winnie the Pooh. And we can all laugh together and love the same things, which is a wonderful thing. So, ladies, thank you. Thank you for the teaching that you've done here at Veritas. Thank you so much for inspiring my daughters. Just as a father, I, I say that, but especially in, in the school community here, just being such a foundational part of kids loving Christ and loving learning. So thank you so much. It is my delight. <laughs> thank you so much, Tom. Yeah. You've been listening to Cultivate, the podcast of Veritas Academy, a preschool through 12th grade classical Christian school in Leola, Pennsylvania. If you would like to learn more about Veritas, please visit veritasacademy.com to discover the truth, beauty, and goodness of classical Christian education.